Experimental economics destroyed whatever was left in me in the notion that, that somehow you could do better than to find institutions that organize this decentralized information and, and create. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're extremely happy to be talking with Vernon Smith, the 2002 Nobel Laureate in Economic Science. Vernon, thanks for talking with us. Nick, it's great to be here. You won your Nobel in experimental economics, a pioneering field. Give us the measure. Where is experimental economics today compared to where it was when you were awarded the uh, Nobel? Well, the, of course, the award did, I think, attract a lot of attention to experimental economics. But I wouldn't, it, you know, it's, experimental economics is still not mainstream economics. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I think, much more important, uh, more influential. In some ways, it's sort of similar to economic history. We're sitting in your office in Chapman University, a uh, beautiful campus in Orange County, California. Tell us about your setup here, and uh, what kind of experiments are you running, and what are you hoping to find through them? One of the uh, a class of experiments that I'm involved in now is a return to the asset trading experiments that we did in the 80s. And in particular, we're asking some questions that have come out of the, the economic crisis. Because we started doing asset trading experiments in the 80s and discovered bubbles mm -hmm. quite unintentionally. In your experiments, you were able to create bubbles, or they, they just popped up? They popped up. In yep. fact, the baseline that we were running, we thought would be so transparent that we wouldn't observe bubbles. Mm -hmm. But we thought we would, with that baseline, see if we could create bubbles. Mm -hmm. But we never had to. How does a bubble take place? I mean, what, well, what goes into the, that? The fundamental value is falling, mm -hmm. like this, okay? Say in one of the designs from $3.60 a share to $0.24 cents a share. The typical pattern for inexperienced subjects is that the trading begins below mm -hmm. the fundamental value. The trading prices mm -hmm. rise and break through this falling, declining fundamental value, and it'll go up and reach a peak, and it collapses at the end. They don't recognize that the value is declining, or they don't care? Uh, let me just say right now, that we don't understand why it is that people get caught up in self-reinforcing expectations of rising prices. What they do is, with experience, they come to believe this information we give them is important mm -hmm. because they get there by experience. Mm -hmm. You see, the first time you're in this experiment, you may have bought early, and you may sell before the break. Mm -hmm. No one can tell you you tell you you did anything irrational. Right. Bring those same people back mm -hmm. in another two or three days. Put them in the same environment, and we get a lower volume bubble. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and typically, it, it it booms earlier and crashes earlier. Well, to some extent, mm -hmm. you see they they're expecting right. a bubble. Bring them back a third time, and now they tend to trade fairly close to fundamental value. How does this type of experiment map onto, I don't know, say maybe the last five years in America? If you think about the housing bubble, mm -hmm. buyers, sellers, borrowers, lenders, real estate agents, mm -hmm. government regulators, everybody believed that prices would, would rise and mm -hmm. continue to rise. And that is, is kind of the essence of right. one of these, uh, a, a, of a bubble. Mm -hmm. Suppose a regulator in 2003 mm -hmm. or four said, hey, this thing is not sustainable. We've got mm -hmm. to do something to stop it. I think he'd have been fired. Right. If the bubble had been stopped, say, in 2003 or four, it'd probably been a lot, lot less damaging. Mm -hmm. But who's going to know that? Right. Now, in your experiments, who, who, are the, uh, who are the people who are running the, uh, the different rounds of, uh, of bidding and things like that? You bring in students, you bring in professionals. Oh, we started out with undergraduates. In frustration, in 1989, I went to Chicago and we recruited a bunch of over-the-counter traders mm -hmm. and brought them in. We had a lab set mm -hmm. up there and we got a bubble. Right. So we soon 
established that this wasn't anything pe peculiar about to the, to the undergraduate subjects mm -hmm. we were using. Why has it taken so long for economics to really kind of try and become more seriously empirical in its operations? It really seems like it's taken forever for economists to actually want to observe actual human beings trading either in an experimental setting or in the real world. Economics enjoyed a major breakthrough in the 1870s, the marginal revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, give us the two-word uh, definition it, it, of the marginal revolution. Well, if you go back to Adam Smith, he was puzzled as to why diamonds command a higher price than water. Right. But whereas obviously water is more useful. Right. And the key idea he didn't have is the notion of marginal utility or marginal value. And unfortunately, <laughs> I think, we lost a lot of the other insights of Adam Smith, you see, because we'd, we'd solved this intellectual problem of understanding kind of better the determination of prices. And equilibrium economics really became uh, uh, in the driver's seat. Which holds? The idea is an economy consists of preferences and technologies for producing goods. This gives you a conjunction of supply and demand where demand depends not upon the price of a, this particular good but of the price of the alternatives mm -hmm. because the concept of opportunity cost comes in on both the demand side and the supply side. Mm -hmm. And so it's a complex problem mathematically and intellectually, but this problem got solved. Mm -hmm. And it helped then to understand the operation of a static right. <laughs> equilibrium world. Of course, the great insight of Hayek and his criticism of equilibrium theory was that it began with a bunch of givens. Mm -hmm that are not, in fact, given to any one mind in the economy. Mm -hmm. and, and the essential thing about a, a real economy is that all this information is dispersed. Mm -hmm. So that the name of the game really is how it is do people discover these equilibria. Right. And that's, of course, where I think the experimental work mm -hmm has importantly dramatized the essence of Hayek's critique. Given existing institutions of trading, people are very good in the laboratory at finding these equilibria that mm -hmm. they don't have any understanding of, mm -hmm. and they get there by repetition. You're a, a pretty hardcore libertarian. You say you're a libertarian with a lot of reservations and whatnot. In the experiments that you run and, and the research that you've done over the years kind of really argues that institutions create the behavior that is either good or bad. Well, it's as a libertarian that I like to emphasize the property rights aspect mm -hmm. of it. People say they, oh, well, what we need is more regulation. Well, listen, all markets have, are regulated mm -hmm. in terms of property rights, that, you know, do's and don'ts. And uh, the, the important thing is that those property rights provide people with the right incentives. Mm -hmm was so devastating in the mortgage market is the separation of mortgage originations from the lender without properly incentivizing the mortgage originator. What's your incentive to do due diligence if you get your right. fee up front and, and then it goes out the back door and, and right. down the line, uh, you know, uh, comes the lenders to buy it, borrow that. You say we got away from, you know, kind of understanding that everybody needs to have skin in the game during the long haul in order that, you know, that you're not just spending other people's money and uh, hoping for a quick cash out or uh, redoubling of, uh, of your investment. What was driving that loss of knowledge? I mean, was it, was it federal policy? Well, was it uh, kind of collective amnesia because we were all you just... You know, the way I would describe it is that we created new mortgage and financial institutions just too fast. Mm -hmm. we, it, it was, no one had an, had an incentive to think it through. Not only was there bad incentives up front with mortgage origination, but those mortgages then would <coughs> be packaged and mortgage-backed securities issued, and then they were rated and insured, quote, mm -hmm. insured. Right. But they weren't collateralized. They were exempt, you see, and, and, 
an exempt meant they were exempt from the property right rules that would have applied if they'd been if derivatives had been classified as securities. This has been a very long recession, and whether or not it's technically ended or not, we're facing slow economic growth. We're facing high unemployment for you know as far as the eye can see. Really, what what are the forces that are extenuating? Or extending this uh, crisis? Well, I think the main problem is the negative equity problem in households or near neg negative equity. And you have something like 22% of homeowners now who owe more on their house than the, than the current market mm -hmm. value. You don't feel like spending money. Mm -hmm. you're, you're paying down debt. What do you do? I mean, you just sit it out until enough of the debt is paid well, down? Well, I think that's or? probably the way we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. It was a mistake to subsidize new home buyers. Existing homeowners, many of them have given them a break in their payments, but they've done it by giving them a lower interest rate and stretching the loan. They haven't right. changed the principal. But that's a disturbing intervention, it is, isn't it? Of course yeah. it's disturbing. Forgiving debt <laughs> is not a good idea, right. but you have to realize we don't face any good options. Right. If it hadn't been done, uh, the, the banking system would likely have collapsed. Mm -hmm. We've had the same problem we had in the, in the, in the 30s. Is that what we've been going through here, if it's, if it's the second worst uh, kind of fiscal crisis, uh, except for the Great Depression, in the past 100 years or in the past 80 years, whatever, I mean, how does it stack up? Because well, I remember the 30s like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, see, in 1932, I was five years old. My father worked for the Bridgeport Machine Company in Wichita, Kansas. He was, he was a, a machinist. We had a farm. So in 1935, we moved to that farm. Mm. Because, and, and it's interesting because in times of stress, there's often this reverse migration from cities to mm -hmm. farms because in the farms you can eat. Right. <laughs> we grew our own vegetables. Mm -hmm chickens, hogs, all of that. And they were very, very difficult years in terms of wheat harvest and that sort of thing. You grew up in Kansas in the, uh, in the 30s and then uh, in terms of high school? Yes, I finished high school in January 1944. I was working at Boeing hmm. at the time and I continued until the following August of 1944, and then I went to Friends University, uh, Quaker College, mm -hmm. not many blocks from where I lived. No. And the reason why I went there was to get make up for my high school education. I had <laughs> been, I was not a good student in high mm -hmm. school, and I didn't have the the math, physics, chemistry that I needed if I was uh, going to go into science. I made up for all of that at Friends University. Did either of your parents go to college? No. So how did you gravitate to even thinking of that as a possibility? My parents always expected it of me, even mm -hmm. though they only had an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. There were people who read. My mother was a, was a socialist mm -hmm. and was a, a political activist. She and when was, you say socialist, I mean she believed that the ownership of uh, the means of uh, oh, yes. production should be collectively owned by the yes. state, et cetera. Yes. But that was that mm -hmm. was really common right. in people in the 1930s. Especially in that part of the country. Oh, yes. You got a master's in economics from Kansas, and then you went to Harvard for your PhD. What were they teaching in economics classes? General equilibrium theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the course I took from Wassily Leonieff, which was the first year theory class at Harvard, was a very good one. We read Irving Fisher. Mm -hmm. I'm still a great admirer. What do you like about him? Fisher was a very clear writer. Mm -hmm. I remember a student once asked Leonieff in class why there was no, a, no school of economics built around Fisher. Mm -hmm. And Leon have said, well, it's because he wrote so clearly, everybody <laughs> could understand what he was saying. Were people free market enthusiasts at that point, uh, or were they all talking about a kind of command economy or uh, heavily I regulated? Think, I think the only clear-cut clear free market enthusiast at Harvard would have been Gottfried Hobbler. Mm -hmm. And he'd come out of the Austrian school. It was a tremendous exodus, of course, out of Germany and sure. Austria 
of not only physicists but economists. Right. Yeah. And uh, Fritz Machlup, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob Marshak, mm -hmm. Schumpeter, mm -hmm. of course. And mm -hmm. when I got to Harvard, Schumpeter had died only of two years earlier. Mm -hmm. And his legacy was very strong. Mm -hmm. Was there a sense that uh, FDR's economic policies and his brains trust, that they had actually succeeded or, uh, you know, and that you were just kind of, uh, I mean, that economists could follow uh, through on that project? Yes. Or? Roosevelt was, you know, in a way kind of saved capitalism. Mm -hmm. Just like George Bush did more yeah. recently. Yes. Yeah. He, he saved it. In fact, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, mm -hmm who was a, had been a supporter of Eugene Victor Debs <laughs> in 1932 became a Roosevelt fan. And I think that tells you a lot about right. what happened in the 30s. Let's uh, talk about that then, and, and it's also a personal uh, journey for you. I know that you've said that uh, your first presidential vote uh, went to Norman Thomas, yes. the socialist in 1948, and then the other uh, presidential vote that you are that was easy for you to make was Ed Clark in 1980, and yes. the Libertarian candidate. In an interesting way, I mean, your journey as kind of demarcated by those votes is is a larger American story of leaving behind a kind of rule by elites or control by elites where we'll take care of everything to something much more individualistic and uh, you know kind of understanding that it's a, a libertarian country, not necessarily in any specifics, yes. but that we need decentralized power, we need decentralized yes. decision making. What, uh, what destroyed experimental the... Experimental economics destroyed whatever yeah. was left in me in the notion that, that somehow you could do better mm -hmm. than to find institutions that organize this decentralized information mm -hmm. and, and create. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's the engine mm -hmm. of wealth creation. In America, I mean, since, say, 1950 to, to the current time, there's been a vast increase in the appreciation of and understanding of economics. Will we be better at uh, kind of not being stupid about how we're acting, even if we know more about economics? The work that has to be done to keep us from getting off track has to be expressed in terms of, of institutional constraints. Mm -hmm when what we do has implications, serious implications for, for innocent other parties. Mm -hmm. Margin rules in the stock market combine the damage to the people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. There's no external uh, blindsiding of all kinds of people that, that, that are innocent. You see, I see it as a property rights mm -hmm. problem. And you know, we got it right in most markets. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of markets work, work Fine, and, and the reason why they work is that you can't steal, you have to trade. <laughs> what essentially we're doing is asking whether was there a type of theft going on mm -hmm. that was not being controlled, you see, by the right property right regime. Federal spending currently is 25% of the economy, a figure that hasn't been seen since World War II, deficits looming large, both in absolute numbers as well as a percentage of uh, the economy. Is that a form of theft as well, or is, is that something that concerns you and that needs to be reined in? We're prim primarily going to solve that problem by inflating out of it. Mm -hmm. I think as a I'm practical very, matter... I am very sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry to say <laughs> it, but I think that will be the way we reduce the burden of the debt. Mm -hmm. It won't be intended. Ben Bernanke talks about the tools he has. Right. Uh, one of the tools he has is to raise the interest rate he pays on excess mm -hmm. reserves. In other words, pay them not uh, to, to, to not expand loans mm -hmm. uh, rapidly if we get into that. But right now he's got the other mm -hmm. problem. But is this also the delusion of the economic planner that once things start happening, he's very smart, he's going to be able to he, control this? And we've seen this before, right, where oh. inflation isn't a problem until it's beyond control. It's really interesting to look at the Federal Open Market Committee uh, press releases in 2007. On August 7, 2007, the press release said, the housing market is going through an adjustment. We're still concerned about inflation. Three days later, because of the collapse right. in the credit default obligation market, that completely changed. The Federal Reserve, Bernanke, realized that they had a financial crisis mm -hmm. on their hands. That's how 
quickly it happened, and it was the signal came from a market. Mm -hmm. It did not come from the econometric models. Mm -hmm. I think it's to Bernanke's credit, he changed, <laughs> he turned mm -hmm. on a dime. How many times that he had said that it was not the business of the Federal Reserve to, to rescue investors from the consequences of their own decisions. That's exactly what he ended up doing. Mm -hmm. I don't and believe he wanted to do it. I think he meant the earlier statements, mm -hmm. but he had no choice. If we hadn't bailed out the banks, if we hadn't passed TARP, we, the economy would have ceased to exist? Or? I think the more important thing was what f the Federal Reserve did, mm -hmm. not the Treasury okay. program. You can always go back and think and say, well, things should have been done earlier to prevent mm -hmm. that from happening. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. But the point is, what do you do in that case? Here it is, mm -hmm. in, in spite of whatever mistakes what, that had been made before. And you know, Bernanke is testing the Friedman-Schwartz right. hypothesis right now <laughs> that if the Fed had acted and, and flooded the system with liquidity in the early 30s that would have prevented the Great Depression. Economists uh, enjoy possibly unprecedented kind of cultural power. I mean, they can write best-selling books. They can run the world economy and whatnot. Where does economics as, an, as a serious discipline need to be moving next? To me, the major problem in economic theory is a preoccupation with modeling for its own sake and, and not asking the fundamental questions. And these fundamental questions, I think, have to do with dynamics, they have to do with property rights. Basic questions like, how could it be that specialization, exchange, and property rights could have come about? You can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. We think today of property rights as something that's determined by the state, that, that comes from the state. Uh, that couldn't be how they, were, they originated. Mm -hmm. Our small group experiments, you know, are trust games. Imagine the game in which I'm a first mover and you're the second mover. I move first. I can choose $10 for each of us, or I can pass to you. Mm -hmm. If I pass to you, the $20 becomes 40 You can give me 15 and keep 25 mm -hmm. or you can give me nothing right. and get the whole 40 Okay, and game theory says I should never pass to you because if you're self-interested, you'll take the 40 mm -hmm. Well, what's remarkable is half the people that we recruit into undergraduate lab, the half of the first movers move mm -hmm. to the second, and two thirds to three quarters of those reciprocate with fifteen twenty five. They don't take the total amount. Mm. You can't understand that with game theory. Mm. You can understand it by reading the theory of moral sentiments. <laughs> is that a learned behavior, or is that an innate behavior? Is that dichotomy not really it's relevant? It's Adam Smith. He says, imagine a human being is brought up in complete isolation from any member of the species. Mm -hmm. He says that person can't have an idea as to what it means for his mind to be deformed any more than he has an idea of what it means for his face to be deformed. Mm -hmm. Bring him into society and you give him the mirror he needs. Mm -hmm. If you read the theory of moral sentiments, mm -hmm. Adam Smith is saying, beneficence is the only thing that requires reward. Mm -hmm. You don't reward justice. What you do is punish injustice. Mm -hmm. Justice is what's left over, right. you see, after you prevent injustice. Mm -hmm. So the property rights come out of human sociality and mm -hmm. then eventually get into civil government, mm -hmm. but they arise originally in small groups. We've been talking with Vernon Smith of Chapman University, Nobel Laureate in Economics. Thanks so much, Vernon. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.